Thanks you all for coming out this uh, this afternoon. Deb and I are really happy to be here. We've had connections with this city for a long time. In fact, it was um, if it was 50 years ago, right now in this very city that we met on a blind date, and we've been together ever since then. So, <laughs> so we're glad to come back to wh where where it all started. We have many family ties with this company and its different incarnations around the world. One of our sons, Tom, worked for about four years at Google. If you've ever seen Google Shopping Express, that was, was his project when he, he worked there. So we're glad to be here and excited to give you what we think is a different message about the country uh, that we are all living in now and that will be shape your collective futures. The way we're going to do this uh, sort of alternating, I'm going to give a brief intro, then Deb will tell you about something that she thinks you'll find surprising, then I'll tell you some more surprises, then Deb will have an additional surprise, and I'll have the, uh, the payoff at the end, and then we'll, we'll have time for questions. So we'll do, go back and forth for about 25 minutes and try to leave you feeling, we hope, better and at least different about the, the condition of the US and, and the world. And the way I thought I'd introduce what we're doing is to read a quote from an editorial recently in the Bakersfield, California newspaper. Who here has been to Bakersfield? Um, those of you who have been, he, been there will join me in saying Bakersfield is not the Marin County or Santa Monica of California. I'm from inland California too. Bakersfield is sort of a, a hard scrabble place in the southern end of the Central Valley. And the editorial in the Bakersfield paper last week said, there is a quietly growing movement brewing in the interior of America. Pretty soon it will boil over, and it's about time somebody covered it. We all know that kind of rhetoric over the past two years in American discourse where the next paragraph has been, people are angry, people are upset, people want to tear things down, people are bitter and divided. In fact, this was an editorial in Bakersfield about the book Deb and I have done and saying that there is city by city across the country this sense of reinvention, renewal, experimentation, new possibility that is at such dramatic odds with the national discourse that, we're all, that, that we all are, are aware of. So that is the experience that Deb and I have had over the last uh, four plus years traveling around and we'll try to convince you of it by the time we are, are done here. So let me tell you just a little bit about how we presume to know what we tell you we, we know about the state of, of the United States right now. Um, I've worked for The Atlantic uh, for a very long time. The magazine is now 168, 161 years old. Is that right? It was founded in 1857, so that would be more or less, I think, 161 years old. I've worked for it as an employee for more than one quarter of its total existence. And we have spent a lot of that time living overseas. We lived in China for a long time. Deb wrote a wonderful book about China called Dreaming in Chinese, which had not the trifecta but the daily double of The New Yorker and Oprah both lauded this book. So, so we were in <laughs> China for a long time. We were in Japan. We've been in Malaysia. And in all these jaunts around the world, we have tried to do our best to get out of the big cities, to go on trains, on ox carts, on buses, however we could, to see the fabric of a country. And we've been doing that in China from 12 years ago, 2006, when we moved there. Off and on, we came back in 2009, went again to China in 2011, and finally came back uh, from China in 2011. And the discourse of world coverage of the U.S. then, if you remember back, was the U.S. had led the world into financial depression, and the U.S. was finally reaping the reward, rewards of this. The U.S. was really falling apart. So we thought as we got back to the U.S., why not try to apply the same repertorial approach we'd had in China and Malaysia and Japan and West Africa and all the rest to the U.S. And in our little propeller plane, who here is a pilot? Come on. Who here is a pilot aspirant? <laughs> who here is interested in the aerial view? I mean, all, yeah, okay. So <laughs> we, for a long time, we've been flying around the country in our little Cirrus airplane. Side note, Cirruses are now the most popular small airplanes in the world, single engine planes, because they have a parachute for the entire airplane. And in time of distress, 
There's a little red handle on the roof of the cockpit, which you pull, and the entire airplane comes to down, uh, comes to, to the earth uh, gently uh, with, with a parachute. So we've been flying around. We knew there were lots of parts of the U.S. that you could more easily get to by small airplane than you could any other way. And so we thought we'd been to places like Grand Island, Nebraska, and Rock Springs, Wyoming, and Red Oak, Iowa, and other places of that sort. What would it be like systematically to look sort of city by city to see what the, how the recovery was doing, what the temper of the, the times uh, would turn out to be? So five years ago, in the spring of 2013, I put an item on the, our, my part of the Atlantic site saying, tell us why we should come to your town. We're looking for smaller towns, by which we meant things that were usually presented in a sort of a two-dimensional or one-dimensional way in the national media. They weren't the 3D full human actors that you saw from New York or DC or LA or San Francisco, but rather people who were covered when there was a shooting or when there was a tornado or when the Iowa caucuses were happening or when there was some concept piece. So tell us about a smaller town that's not usually in the media that has had some kind of problem, factory closing, you know, drought, you name the problem, and has an interesting part of its response, and we'd like to come hear about it. We got about a thousand essays on one of those Google response forums. I forget what, what's the what's the term for it, where I have I ask people that it's some you know spreadsheet that, that auto populate. We got more than a thousand essays, people saying here's why Moline is the city of the future. Here's why Yakima, Washington, is the city you should come to. And over the last, um, since from the summer of 2013 until early 2017, we spent about half our time on the road, city by city. Uh, you will see that we uh, were from in the far northeast in Eastport, Maine, the far southwest in Ajo, Arizona. We were in the Central Valley of California in places with some really hard times. And the cumulative message that we ended up presenting in hundreds of, of, of web posts and in some articles and uh, in, in this book now are that the narrative of America at sort of the cellular level or at the organic systems level is really different from what it is at the national level. And most people feel much more hopeful, much more better, uh, much better and much more engaged about a part, the part of the United States that ex they experience in their direct lives than they do about the part that comes through the media. And the polls reflect this too, with only about 25% of the public thinks the U.S. is on the right course, but about 80% of the public thinks their own communities are on the right course now. And that's been a stable finding for the past few years. So this was a journey of a lot of surprises for us. And I will tell you about a sort of checklist of main surprises and take homes in just a moment. But I give you now Miss Deborah Fellows, who is going to tell you about one of the central surprises that is related to a lot of your work. Deborah. You can call me Deb. <laughs> <laughs> when, when Jim and I first landed in a town, and we would usually stay for a couple weeks at a time, we rounded up the usual suspects and went out together on our first day. We talked to the newspaper editor, somebody connected with schools, maybe the Chamber of Commerce, the mayor, the city manager. Um, we'd hang out in brew pubs. We'd you know, wrangle people on the streets and, and on bikes. And, and then we would split up after that and kind of follow their lead. Jim usually covered political and economic development kinds of things, what was the business of the town. I would go to a lot of the social institutions, like the schools and the public libraries and, to, and the YMCA's, places like that. I want to tell you today a little bit about my favorite one of all, which is this thriving public institution of the public libraries in towns. And this, this completely took me off base because the library I grew up with is a very quiet, kind of intimidating place where librarians who are always kind of mean would shush you and not allow you to talk. I, I can see that a lot of you are probably in a next generation of libraries, but what I learned about the libraries is, is mainly in three different categories. Education, technology, and civic and social life as a community center. I'll lead with the technology because that's where you all are. And as a, as a reality check, I'm going to tell you a little story of what I heard and saw in the Columbus, Ohio pub, main public library. Um, 
usually when you walk in, there are big banks of computers everywhere, as there were in this library. And one of the most popular things going on at those computers is, is a job search. So there was a young man sitting at, at the computer, and a librarian had come over to help him look for a job. They scrolled all around, found a couple things that seemed likely and possible, landed on one, and she drew up the application for this job on the, on the computer and said, you fill it in, I'll come back in 15 minutes, we'll look it over and we'll take it from there. She went away, came back after 15 minutes, and he had indeed filled it in, the application, but with a marking pen on the face of the screen. So that is the kind of, that is the degree of low-end technology and the challenge for public libraries in that respect. On the high end, it's, it's much more what you would probably recognize, maker spaces in my, in our hometown of Washington, D.C. at the main public library, I went on a tour of the maker spaces. There were like standing room only, everything from artists to people doing startups to a mom who was there with her two homeschool kids trying to figure out projects. And education and everything from how to use 3D printers to laser cutters to you name it. And even stuff like your, you might have seen in a family home basement workshop. Um, and Another interesting thing is, is maybe some of you have started in libraries where um, entrepreneurs will, who can't afford a home office or any kind of office to rent will sit day after day in the same spot at the main reading room and, and get their company going from there, take a break to take calls in the garden or a latte in the shop. And I asked the librarians, is this something that you resent, you know, that all the, these young, young people, as we call you, are um, starting companies in your library? And they said, absolutely not. This is, we just hope when they're successful, they remember when they, where they started and can't come back here and support us. So um, education in libraries, one of the first things that directors will always say is, you've got to see the children's section. If there's any extra money in libraries, it will go to the children's section to try to fill in the gaps of education that are around in small, in, in towns, the preschool and pre-reading. Um, if I said, tell me, what's, what's reading readiness? And the library director said, if you've got a kindergartner going into school and hand him a book and he holds it upside down, there is no reading readiness there. So that's the kind of starting point of where, where education is in, in libraries, is a lot of dedication to the preschool for kids, preschool skills. It goes all the way through elementary school, homework help, special areas for high schoolers that are kind of cool, so kids will want to hang out there, and a, a, adult literacy, which is often the most popular program for volunteers, adults teaching adults how to read. Um, in the social and civic sense, the civic engagement in libraries is, is really basic. You know, it's everything from ESL to citizenship courses to tax preparation um, to welcoming refugees in towns as their kind of first landing spot. To, and then there's the social stuff, which is really the fun stuff that goes on with libraries. I, at my library, there's yoga every Tuesday. In the main, on Saturdays at 4 p.m. in the main reading room of the DC Public Library, I walked in and there were 70 people doing the tango. There were the professionals with music accompaniment, there were the regulars who were learning how to do the tango. Um, and it's all kinds of lending programs. In Duluth, Minnesota, they lend, there's a seed lending library. Take your seeds, plant them in the garden, bring them back next. In, Burlington, Vermont, you could, the kids come in to rent, uh, to borrow snow shovel equipment on the weekends, make a little money, Just shoveling snow, take it back. In my hometown of Vermilion, Ohio, which is on Lake Erie, you can borrow fishing poles and go out swimming. In Denver, you can borrow the complete backpack and, back and hiking equipment from libraries to go hiking there. So it's the, the, the point of all this is that in towns, in, in local town America, the library is really the institution that is filling in the gaps that are there and in the way that they can in civic, social, educational, and technological sense. And um, so part of what we really feel strongly about is to try to get this message out because so many librarians I heard said, 
after explaining all the things that their libraries did, said that, you know, one of our problems is that the libraries are the best kept secret in town, and they, that's a place they don't want to be. So Jim's surprising them too. <laughs> yeah. So Deb was telling you about libraries as a surprise. We had assumed, so how many of you would have assumed that libraries are a way down, sort of like, uh, you know, Barnes and Noble or whatever? You know, we've seen them as, as, as coming back. Here is a quick list, just a list them without elaborating very much, of other things that were surprising to me personally uh, that I wouldn't have, have guessed five years ago. I have an article in the current issue of The Atlantic in which I say, that reporting is the process of learning what you didn't know until you showed up. And these were things that, that you know, the, the why I've loved being a reporter is the things you experience by being out there. So here is a quick list of things that we think are lessons of seeing the country sort of city by city and not asking people about national politics. The first of them is particularly relevant to a place like this. How many of you started out in, I'm going to separate the U.S. into metropolis and countryside. So metropolis is Boston, D.C., L.A., countryside, every place else. How many of you started out metropolis? And how many started out sort of countryside? So we have a mixture here. And those of you who have come to a place like Cambridge and Boston, you illustrate one of the great trends of American history and world history, which is the concentration of people in these big centers. Finance in New York, education and medicine and tech in Boston, entertainment in LA, we know the, the whole drill. And that, of course, is a very important ongoing pressure. We were really struck again and again by the sort of reverse osmotic flow of people who thought, I have had a job in Cambridge, I do have a job offer in Seattle or in New York City, but for me and my family, the overall life balance is much better in Fresno or in Greenville or in Duluth or in Erie or in you know, a lot of the other uh, towns we're talking about for a combination of reasons that involve real estate arbitrage. You know, there's a dozen cities in the United States where your life is destroyed by real estate and every place else is cheap. And so there is that, that factor that makes people think they can start their lives and their families uh, better elsewhere. There is a sense of engagement of being in a scale of place where you can make things happen as opposed to just uh, sort of observing what, what happens. Uh, there are local ties of people feeling that they're imprinted by the feel of the Midwest or the feel of the South or the feel of the Pacific uh, Northwest. But again, if you, um, our book is presented kind of as a shaggy chronicle, sort of a whole earth catalog of things that are happening around the country. But you'll hear stories of people like you all who thought that the better balance for them was someplace other than, than the metropolis. A second surprise involved the political temper of the times. How many of you have heard, oh, the nation is more divided than ever before? We've all heard that. It's true in Washington, D.C. It's true on cable news. It's not true of most of the country and most of what it does. And here's the easiest way I know how to illustrate that. Uh, have any of you been to Greenville, South Carolina? You know, it's a really now economically and sort of culturally progressive place. It has a BMW plant, a Michelin plant, et cetera, and, and a very beautiful downtown. I assume most of you have been to Burlington, Vermont, which is very near here. Politically, these are opposite cities. Burlington, home of Bernie Sanders. Greenville, home of Trey Gowdy and Jim DeMint and South Carolina. If you didn't know they were opposite, you would think they were the same city. They work the same way. The university with the mayor, with the downtown organizations. And if we didn't ask people about the divisive issues of national politics, they didn't usually come up. And there was sort of the practical mindedness that you'd like to think Americans were known for was also evident. Um, another thing that was surprising and striking to me is how widespread in the country is the sense of being personally, culturally, ethnically, or regionally looked down on, and the effects that has on how people behave. Now, we, those of us who are not from New York can assume that New York looks down on everything, but almost everybody else feels looked down on. The South by the North, interior California by the coast, non-whites by whites, the farmers from the countryside. You can have almost any uh, gradation of this, this that, that you want. When I was in high school in uh, Redlands, California, Joan Didion 
a uh, famous writer wrote a story about how my hometown was like the worst place in California. So this is uh, something that had, had a marker with me. And in many parts of the country, this has been a motivating force. Who here has been to Fresno, California? You know, Fresno in the Central Valley, they are aware of not being the stylish center of California. So two of their mottos, one is a rebranding to Fres Yes. The other is a new sort of civic revival program under the, the label Unapologetically Fresno. And that we've seen that in West Virginia, we've seen it in many other places in Mississippi where we spent a lot of, of time. We've seen, I'll just mention two other things which were surprising and, and striking. We all know about the dislocation of industrial workers over the past generation as the giant factories of a bygone era have been truly bygone. What has been surprising to us is how the interesting contrary flow of high schools and community colleges training people whose parents worked in those factories and don't work there anymore for the new tech jobs, skilled tech jobs that are emerging and are high demand as welders, as, uh, as um, wind turbine repair people and a long other list. If you go to Western Kansas now, you see the two competing industries. You see the wheat fields and inside of them, the wind turbines sprouting out, sprouting out of the wind fields, uh, the wheat fields, which are a major source of, of wealth. That was um, really, really interesting. And finally, in the, the realm of surprises, I think almost all of us would think of city government as the word sort of call up hide boundness and out of dateness and not being innovative in the way that a tech company might be. I would contend that city government right now is one of the most innovative and experimental parts of American society where people are trying different ways to engage their, their citizens, to have tech sensors to inform them on what they're doing, and we saw countless illustrations of that. So most of the, th we saw some bad surprises. We saw opioids as a, as a horrible scourge of the country now. We saw the effects of industrial dislocation but we also saw a lot of surprises that we had not anticipated. So now I give you Deb. Deb is a, a, a advanced linguistics scholar, and now she has a, the linguistics part of the conversation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> advanced linguistics well, scholar, right. You have a PhD, <laughs> come on. Okay. Part of this was a, a really a listening tour to me. I was, I was interested to hear the regionalisms versus nationalisms that we all pick up from the media and so forth. And it was around about Greenville, South Carolina, into our second year, I guess, that we heard uh, this question from people. You know, when you f if you're in a gathering like this and you don't know each other, after you introduce each other to, to your, yourself to each other, you might start with a second question. And I was interested in what that second question would be. In Greenville, South Carolina, it was, where do you go to church? When I first heard it, I was really kind of taken aback because I thought, this is personal, this is intrusive, you know, why are you asking me this question? What if I don't go to church, et cetera, et cetera? And um, so I started asking and listening in different places, what's your second question? And, and interestingly, I think in Boston, it, it's a version of that. I heard a lot of people say, maybe an older generation, of what's your parish? In Chicago, it's the what's your parish. It doesn't even matter if you're Catholic, you know what parish you live in. So it's, it's you know, the geographical marker. Um, is it anybody here, I'm going to stick my neck out, is anybody here from, from St. Louis? Okay, Are you, can you tell me, what's the second question in St. Louis? Where'd you go to school? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> it has never failed. That is absolutely the second question in St. Louis. Um, we were in Louisville last week, and the version of that question, it's not where'd you go to high school, it's where'd you go to school, because the assumption is that that just means high school, and, it, and you're not asking beyond that. So, um, in DC, of course, it's where do you work, or what do you do, or who do you work for. Um, same thing kind of in New York, unless you start asking about, uh, real estate goes up there, where do you live, like kind of sizing you up in your socioeconomics. Um, the what do you do question in Denver and Burlington actually means what do you do for fun, like do you hike, do you, do you ski, do you snowboard, what do you do? Um, LA, how'd you get here? Well, I took the 10 to the 405, and on and on. In, in Minnesota, I learned last week, it's land of 10,000 lakes. I'm, I'm 
from Minnesota for 10 years. Um, what's your lake? Or what <laughs> lake do you go to? And in Wyoming, no kidding, well, maybe kidding, did you get your elk yet? <laughs> it's like everybody gets an elk, and you, want an, and you get a badge for your elk, and so did you get your elk yet? Um, Atlanta and Seattle, and I don't know, maybe Boston, the question is, um, where, where are you from? Because so many people are there for Seattle, we know why, you know. Um, Atlanta, same thing, and, and it's just ingrained in them. There are two places where you dare not ask that question. One is Alaska, because so many people kind of relocate to Alaska because they want to get away from their past life and don't want anybody interfering, so everybody knows not to say where you're from. Similarly, in Hawaii, on the Big Island, you don't say where you're from because that is a big witness protection program area. And it's much too intrusive to ask that. So uh, one more, my f absolute favorite, is from New Orleans. And this is a bit, well, I'll just say what it is. I heard two versions of it. One is, who's your mama? Who's your mama? Because everybody, kn everybody in New Orleans kind of knows each other. And everybody knows who your daddy is, but they can't tell from your name who your mama is. So who's your mama? Or the mo more colloquial version, how's your mama in them? Which is <laughs> the kind of nice intro to that. So I am collecting more of these if you have them from your places. Everybody's got one, and they're kind of the currency of the town. Um, and. That's why I have a degree in advanced linguistics. Right? <laughs> <laughs> a, a virtue of having been around Cambridge when we were long ago is that Deb was studying linguistics um, at what was then called Radcliffe, but there was this guy named Noam Chomsky who was a linguistics professor in this part of town you would come learn from too. Yeah. So this is the two minute big finish where I'm going to tell you what this all means. They'll ha have, have questions. So suppose you are thinking right now these people are crazy. They've just been avoiding the harsh realities of the U.S. by going to garden spots like San Bernardino, where we spent a lot of time, or northern Mississippi, or Erie, Pennsylvania, or other places. You know, we've been to a lot of places that are, are rough, Charleston, West Virginia. So if you think this is really a unrepresentative view of these past four plus years you know, all around the country, um, the experiment I'd suggest is over the next year or so, try to go to half a dozen places you don't know. And when you get there, don't ask people about national politics. If you ask them, what about Trump? It's like turning on CNN. You just know what you're gonna hear. But if you ask them, how about the schools? Who's moving here? How are things uh, getting better or worse? And not in every place in the US will things be getting better because over the past century and a half, many, many small towns are just too small to, to survive. And, and, and we, uh, we can talk about more of that later on. But in many of the places we were looking at, sort of these medium-sized places of, of uh, 20,000, 50,000, et cetera, things were going in a positive direction. So see, you can test uh, your experiences against ours. But suppose you think, actually, we might be right, and that you're willing at least to accept our hypothesis that there's this historic shift between national-level dysfunction and bitterness and, and inability to match the resources of the country to the needs of the country, there's a gap between that and this local level awareness of practicality and experimentation and willingness to compromise and ability to make long-term plans. Suppose you thought that actually might be true. What would you do then? I can tell you what we intend to do for the foreseeable future is I, I apply a historical model to this. When Deb was studying her linguistics in college, I was studying American history, which is the main thing I've just tried to read about and learn about in the, in the interim. And it does seem to me there's a real lesson to be learned from the period from 1880 to, say, 1920, the original Gilded Age, the original progressive and populist and reform era, in the way that so many of the dislocations we're having now extremes of sudden new um, wealth from sudden new technologies, people suddenly losing their traditional livelihood, political dysfunction, political corruption, regional bitterness, all those things have their precedence 150 years ago or so. But also, you look back and see all the different people 
in all their dispersed ways who were trying to create a different country. You had the people in the labor union movement starting after the Civil War. You had the women's movement. You had the African American rights movement. You had immigrant rights movements. In almost every big city, you had sort of uh, you know civic improvement movements from Jane, Jane Addams onward. In California, you had the good government movement. You had a whole lot, you had the conservation movement starting under Teddy Roosevelt and, and his peers. And the collection of those people working together without knowing they were pulling in the same direction for quite a long time over those decades meant that when the temper of national politics changed, as it finally did, there was a whole array of experiments and organizations and solutions that had been tried, the ones that had succeeded and ones that hadn't, and that what Louis Brandeis was saying about the, la the states being the laboratories of democracy, looking back on that time, really is true we think of cities right now. So we actually think it is like that era again now, and there is a real battle underway for the soul and future of the country between the poison that is dripping down from the national level, which is what dominates our news, and all these sources of experimentation and hope and new ideas that from most of the country in a lot of, of, of uh, independent places are being tried out and succeeding sort of city by city and, and region by region. Um, our friend, well, David Brooks of, of the New York Times had a column about two weeks ago based on our book saying the headline of which was, the American Renaissance is already underway. And his point was not, you know, the nation doesn't have really grave problems, but it does. His point was, that many, many people are already finding ways to try to use the technologies of this era to connect people, uh, the, the new awareness and possibility to apply different solutions. So we think this struggle is really underway. And we hope that when historians 150 years from now look back on all of this, thus us in this era, they'll say that you here with your technologies and people we've seen in Mississippi and Oregon and South Dakota and people in, in state houses and, and city um, halls around the country were like the, their predecessors in the early, earlier progressive era, figuring out the solutions that would uh, make, make a better country possible. So that in brief and rushed fashion is our pitch. You'll find the stories in uh, the book. So Deb, would you please come up here and choose people to answer questions or to ask questions? So thank you, that's our pitch. Okay. <laughs> yeah. A question I have is about like, something that I worry a lot about and, try, and spend a lot of kind of like mental energy and time trying to figure out is um, like the separation between like what's going on locally and I try to get very involved in the town of Arlington wh where, where I live today, again, local politics and civic uh, uh, engagement there and national politics. And I've tried to mix the two over time and it, they don't blend so well, right? They show up to like say an indivisible meeting, like a resistance meeting, you say, hey, let's talk about like you know, bridging divides with like Republicans and conservatives, it doesn't go over so well. So these things just don't mix very well, but at the same time, it, it, it's hard to justify focusing on one or the other. So how do you prevent, like what, what would you recommend doing on the civic local level that kind of insulates you to some extent from the national politics without burying your head in the sand? Because like these divisions kind of trickle down, right? Where it's like, we see divisions in town that, that seem to me to uh, um, come from a lot of that kind of national level division seeping into like these micro factors start forming with it, like between liberals and progressives within our community, not necessarily red and blue divides, but similar sorts of divides of where you stand on certain issues. So like, how, like how, how do you do that locally without being infected by the national politics? This is a hard question that we've spent a lot of time thinking about. And let me give you my, uh, my the current state of my thoughts on it. Um, I once worked in national politics long ago before uh, many, anybody here was even you know, 10 years away from existing. I, it, when Jimmy Carter was president, I worked in his campaign. I was a speechwriter in the White House. And I've stayed sort of observing national politics since then. What I have learned about national politics is that it's a combination of things which are foreseeable and you can sort of have uh, you know, vector diagrams and things that are, are accidental. And there are, we're still living with the effects of Lyndon Johnson deciding to sign the Civil Rights Act or pushing the Civil Rights Act you know, 50 plus years ago and the ways in which that peeled the, the white South away from the Democratic Party. That is sort of the fundamental political movement of our time, making the Republicans a white-based party. We're dealing with Supreme Court rulings on political donations. We're dealing with lots of other things. 
also, there is, so that, those are the fundamental factors. At the national level, there are also things no one can foresee. Um, I was at, at the Democratic Convention in 2004 when Barack Obama made his, his keynote address. People there were saying, yeah, this guy is, is a comer, uh, but six months before that, nobody would have imagined Obama becoming the president in 2008 and things of, the, uh, of that sort. Um, in 1988, when we were living in Japan, through sort of the accidents of media intensity, Gary Hart went from being the likely next president to having lead, lead the race, you know, for sort of accidental factors. The races of 2000 and 2016 turned out the way they did for a thousand dominoes pointing in a certain direction. So the reason I'm saying this is, similarly with Jimmy, I'll go back to Jimmy Carter, he was elected in the fall of, 2000, uh, of 1976 comfortably. Two years before that, nobody would have imagined that he would have ended up as president as a former one-term governor of Georgia. And there are times in which the mood of the country changes in a way that makes a certain person the voice of that mood, as happened to Carter, as happened to Obama, in a arguably as happened with Trump. So to lead this to the local, I think the next step is to do everything one can locally so as to make the mood of the country such that a person whom we can't foresee right now ends up two years from now, six years from now, being the voice of that, that sentiment. Whether it is a Democrat, you can list a dozen of them. Whether it's a Republican, you list one or two of them who would seem to be the voice of what people will want. One other uh, point. It's the, it is a pattern in U.S. Pol presidential politics that almost always um, President X is succeeded by President X plus one, who is the opposite on almost all fronts. You have George W. Bush after Bill Clinton. You have Bill Clinton after George H. W. Bush. You have Obama after George W. Bush. You got Trump. Um, so I think somebody different from Trump will be the next person. So mainly my while we wait to see what the linkage is from the local to the national, we do everything we can locally to prepare the mood of the country. You talk a lot about uh, how the national rhetoric differs from what's happening on the local, uh, local scene, and a lot of that national rhetoric is coming from the national media. What can the national media do better to give more of a realistic or uh, nuanced look at what's happening on the local level? And then also, how can we as a society kind of better support the lo what's going on on the local level, journalism, um, to kind of create more of a nuanced dialogue about what's going on. This is such an important point, and if only you all were associated with some major technology company that, that has, uh, uh, so, so, yes. It is of first order importance there's never been a time in history where we would think of as serious news, that is, coverage of state houses or in international affairs or all the rest. There's never been a time when that has been a viable self-sustaining business. It always has had to attach itself to some other host body, whether it was the bundled news packages of yesteryear when I was a kid in Redlands, the LA Times was like 800 pages a day with because it was the only newspaper you, you could get, or network TV or whatever. And the history of modern journalism is continued sort of death of the host body and moving on to, to something new. Google and Facebook together have been agents of eliminating you know, the, the sort of host body of the last 20 years of destroying the advertising model that kept journalism going. And that is not anybody's fault, but it's the reality. And as journalism struggles to find its next host body, it is of really central importance that the organizations and people who were agents of this transition helped think about its, its consequences and solutions. One reason I have admired Google over the years, including when we were living in China and Google was standing up in the right ways, is I think the people, the leadership of Google has generally been conscious of both the negative as well as the positive effects of, of the revolution it is engendering. So um, I think that, that if you're working with Google News, it's important that you be part of the experimentation with, with journalist, journalistic institutions to see how the new model can emerge. Also, I think 
individual rich people from Google and other tech companies have a civic and historic obligation to try to shore up the public infrastructure of this era. To wrap, wrap up this, this pitch, we look back on the people who had sudden fortunes 150 years ago, whether it's Carnegie or Mellon or Rockefeller or Ford or Heinz or Frick or whatever, we now think of them not just as financial barons but as something else because they shored up the public infrastructure at that time with museums and universities and parks and all the rest. And I hope that their counterparts now will also recognize individual as well as institutional um, responsibilities to help build up the public infrastructure. The cost of setting up a sort of a Peace Corps-like situation for local reporters, it would be trivially inexpensive, like a Teach for America for local journalists. I know Google is doing some of those things, but more and more that would make an enormous difference to find ways for young people to go out there to Fresno, to Spokane, and all the rest. So that's, uh, that's my pitch. <laughs> I agree. And, and you can tell that you have hit two of the themes that are most important in, in Jim's heart. So thank you. Several years ago, the Harvard political scientist Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And the main theme of that book was the decline of civil society in the United States, basically the lack of group engagement. Uh, basically, anomi, you know, in, in towns across the country, people not in fact, doing things together so much and you know isolating themselves. Um, he f wrote a follow-up book uh, a couple years ago where he went back to his own high school in northern Ohio, uh, his own town, his own hometown, and found increasing segregation, inc increasing economic inequality there, and again, just divisions that, according to him, did not really exist when he was uh, a younger person. Now you're, you're coming along, it sounds like you're writing a story that's really the complete opposite of what Putnam found. And I'm, I'm just curious about how you see your work in the context of what Putnam found. Basically, was Putnam wrong or was he kind of right? And we still see some of that, but what you're really finding is just a kind of a breaking out of that pattern. I, I think uh, closest to, to the last possibility you were mentioning. So we know Robert Putnam, of course, we respect Robert Putnam. We've debated these issues with him. And I think it's, it's a combination of we're seeing, we're seeing something several years later after he wrote, and we're seeing it in a different kind of, of, of reportage. So let, let's stipulate, I, and, and we're also seeing about kinds of connections that, that he, he left out of, of his, his description, which I'll illustrate for a second with, with Dodge City. So of course it is the case that as in the original Gilded Age, there are you know, increasing economic extremes, and, and that, that is a, a genuine problem to deal with, and that federal policy is making it worse now rather than better with, with a new tax policy, et cetera. So those compared with, with with white society in the 50s and 60s. It, you know, it is more polarized than it was then. The, the two counters I would offer is that while the bowling leagues of Northern Ohio, where Deb is also from, may be different from when Robert Putnam was a kid, we saw lots of different things that were coming up. The maker spaces are a different kind of, of, of alliance from the, from the, the bowling leagues. And, and just, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, the, the the craft brewing movement, no, no kidding, is becoming like bowling leagues of the, these days, where it was really spreading all over the place. I think it's also the case that recognizing that race is the fundamental American crisis and problem, compared with the America Putnam is writing about 50 years ago, it is less separated than it was. And a lot of the stories we're giving in the Midwest, in Dodge City, uh, and Garden City, Kansas, in, uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is Rust Belt rather than Midwest, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, are of white society being much more connected with Latino and black society and refugee society than was the case 50 years ago. So I think it's a, the problems of polarization are real, but I think it's a more complicated situation than, than you would think just by the decline of bowling leagues. Bowling leagues in Ohio may be down, lots of other things are up, and can you tell the brief story of the of the ROTC student in Sioux Falls from oh. Somalia? I, I was <laughs> going to tell the brief story of the kids in San Bernardino, oh, um, yeah. which is an example of in a Somalia. rising up of, of civic 
groups with a, with a direction and a purpose. The, San Bernardino is a really troubled town, and the kids who grew up there, who let's call them millennial, let's call them 30-year-olds, plus or minus five, five years, are, whom we met and spent a lot of time with, are, are so tired of people naysaying their town and feel that they have an opportunity and an obligation to make things better in that town. So they got together. They were primarily artists. And they formed a little group, which Americans are great at doing. They're forming new groups, not bowling groups, but other kinds of groups. And the purpose of the, what these kids did was, the end of it was to bring into the mind share of, of high school kids the importance of voting. And the way they got there was a kind of Pied Piper movement, starting with cleaning up the parks. They, and they eventually, as artists, they'd draw murals and, and instead of graffiti and bad graffiti, they'd draw nice graffiti. And they eventually had groups of young kids following them around. And then they would have um, uh, fairs and festivals that were based around music and kind of earning the goodwill of the young people in the town. And then made a video that, that very age appropriate that they could take into the high schools to start to imprint on them the importance of, you want to get to the end of this, you've got to vote. And you've got to understand your civic responsibility there. So it, it's like, what do you call that group? I mean, they say, we are not an organization. We are a movement. And we saw many examples of similar kinds of things where people would get together for some purpose and, and banding together. So it, it's not a bowling league, but it's, it is a group of, with a purpose of doing something. We gave you a mil million more illustrations, but I, I won't, yeah. Uh, when I was looking at the map, I, I wasn't going to bring up St. Louis, and then you did. <laughs> uh, but uh, looking at that and hearing your stories, I'm hearing a lot of places where there's at least some chances for, dis for central kind of governmental decisions. You know, many of these are small towns where it sounds like most of the people live in a place where they can contribute to the same city government who can make d big decisions. Um, my history growing up in St. Louis was of a region that had a real trouble hanging together. Decisions basically got arbitraged through a state government that was also worried about rural issues, was worried about other cities in the state. And so the ability of two people who maybe lived a mile away from each other, there was no one to go to except a governor who was maybe thinking about a presidential run at some point to bind them together. And I was curious if there were places where you saw more of that regional, several cities in a region that were able to come together without having to necessarily depend on state government. That is interesting. We saw a number of places where arbitrary political boundaries were a really significant factor. And I think Erie, Pennsylvania is one of the most important ones. I don't know if, know if any of you are from Erie. It looks at first glance like sort of this nightmare scape of industrial decline with all these rotted out industrial buildings and, and a GM a GE plant that's closing down. But at the same time, the people in their 20s and 30s have a really sort of uh, active startup up culture there. But Erie is handicapped by the balkanization of Pennsylvania school district funding, mm -hmm. where Pennsylvania has like five times as many administrative units as the state of California does, you know, with, with um, many fewer people. And it means that there's a real financing squeeze on Erie and everybody moves to the suburbs. And there are things like that. We were in Kansas City 10 days ago, Kansas City, you know, Missouri, Kansas, with, with all of its straddles. The places where we probably saw the most effective, re uh, I can tell you a place that is aspiring to it in, sub in inland Southern California, where San Bernardino, really troubled, Redlands, small and more successful, and Riverside, large and more successful, are trying to find some sort of pan-regional inland empire consciousness. They're divided by a county line there, San Bernardino County versus Riverside County. Um, I think western Kansas um, and, um, it, and uh, it, northern Mississippi, of course. Yeah, so, so in, in different segments, yeah. like in Fresno. Clovis and Fresno, yeah. which are in separate counties, they came together on the schools and on some school issues, which everybody thought couldn't happen. In, in Central in, Oregon. That's true. So, so yeah. to interrupt there, around Bend, which is now, is, so Bend is now famous as this resort site. 20 years ago, it had the highest unemployment rate in the country, or 25 years ago, but at some recent time because of the timber industry. And in Central Oregon, there was no four-year university. 
So a number of towns and counties there sort of work together on the Central Oregon Community College, which and, and really the important. Golden Triangle of Mississippi, which you yeah. So we have a long there. chapter in there about the cities of West Point, Columbus, and Starkville, Mississippi, which are in three separate counties in Mississippi. But they have they have real coordinated effort when they brought in advanced manufacturing and have been in a quite impressive ascent. And, and Erie's definitely yeah. talking about that too. They they are saying we need to. We need to look out yeah. a little bit, not just our little town, into into regionalisms. And, and greater Columbus, Ohio, too. So, so it's an important point that people are trying to cope with in different ways. When you first came to a town or city, what are some of the more surprising uh, indicators of either civic health or dysfunction that you found to be consistently reliable? <laughs> Does somebody have a copy of this book I might borrow for a moment? <laughs> Most of this book is written just as narrative. You know, here's what we saw in Sioux Falls. Oh, well, we have an intro and an outro. And there's a, uh, there's the, the last part of it is called Ten and a Half Signs of Civic Success. These are the things we learned along the way, and most of them are high road. Uh, for example, that we would always ask somebody, who makes things go here? And all that mattered is that there was an answer. And the answer in Charleston, West Virginia, was a, a country music singer named Larry Gross, who some of you may know. He has a program called Mountain Stage on uh, on public radio, which has been a, a fundamental fact in, in, in Charleston, West Virginia. And in Eastport, Maine, it was Captain Bob Peacock and Linda Godfrey and some of the others. And so, so is there a local patriot? Is there a local story? Do people understand where the city is on sort of the ascent of mankind uh, type of chart and why the things we're doing now uh, will, will have benefits in the, in the future? Uh, but the, I say there are ten and a half signs. The half sign is, is there a craft brewery? Because a craft brewery has become a genuine source of employment. It's a sign of a certain kind of entrepreneur, a certain kind of customer, and a way in which the downtown will be expanded by bringing um, new areas into, into you. So we, but the end of the book is ten and a half signs of civic success. So you can see it all there. I'm very excited about the prospects of us progressing through this poisoned atmosphere. But I'm wondering, uh, sort of the flip side of the coin, nothing's inevitable. So what would it look like if that didn't happen? Because it feels as if the whole administration that's there is getting thinner and thinner, and just isn't enough to actually support long-term poison. But uh, I don't want to get my hopes too high up. This is a whole separate topic, which we can talk about offline. I think you, you would see the Atlantic going into this with 100 articles a day about all sort of the, the mechanics of the, of the current struggle. I think what would ha it would be better if we had a functioning national government, and I think we will ultimately, because there's things that only a national government can do from from uh, environmental standards to, to other kinds of standards that hold the country together. I think the alternative is having California be more and more on its own and Texas more and more on its own, and that would be okay in various ways, but I think uh, I'd rather than speculate on how bad things might look 20 or 30 years from now, think about making sure people get out to vote in the next few months and that they experiment locally to provide the fodder for the next wave of renewal. So with that, I think we turn it back to centers and thank you thank all you. for thank you all for coming very much. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you.